the increasing amount of people who are <clears throat> ill, who suffer from depress depression. That is a, <clears throat> a certain, <clears throat> excuse me, a certain uh, sign of losing the connection to the world around us. And many of these crises have to do not only, but they have to do with the development of technology. And when we look at that, um, at Steiner's time, the technology where <coughs> the early telephones, um, the steam engines, some combustion engines, and a little bit of electricity. And during the last century, everything moved to electricity. When you go by train, it's with electricity, at least in Europe. <clears throat> when you go, go by car, everybody says the future is with electricity. And so, and all the other, other technologies, more or less, <coughs> sorry. more or less disappear. So the question, what is electricity, uh, seems to be a relevant one. And Steiner connected that in a way with subnature, with this term of subnature. And I would like to explore that a little bit with you. But before we go to that, I would tell a few examples how Steiner dealt with technology. Because sometimes anthroposophists are uh, thought to be against technology. And uh, Steiner definitely was not. Now one can, of course, uh, ask, one needs to ask oneself, and um, that was 100 years earlier, and <clears throat> what would he say today about technology? <clears throat> and that's a good thing because it shows that we can't rely on the authority as sometimes anthroposophists did in the last century and said Steiner said and Steiner has done this and that and today we just can only rely on our own judgment with the background of anthroposophy. So that's I think an uh, important step. Now uh, Steiner as you know uh, went by train went by car around in Europe and, and he used the telephone and uh, there are some nice examples I would like to tell a few. Uh, one is there was a meeting of the Anthroposophical Society in Netherlands and it was a long meeting with contributions and another contribution. And, and Steiner sat in this meeting and close to him, the president of the society in Netherlands, Simons von Hemmekoven. <clears throat> he was a tall man, a gentleman, never with an open jacket. <laughs> <laughs> and he played with his pouch for tobacco, which has a zipper. <laughs> and that was very new at that time. It was invented in around 1970. I looked that up. <laughs> he played with his zipper, which Daniel did, took, asked him to give him the pouch, played himself, <laughs> and said to Silvans, and that from him we know that, what a pity that no one from us invented that. <laughs> <laughs> or he started a lecture in Donach, stood at the lantern, 
and people expect that an anthroposophical letter, a lecture about hierarchies, but I don't know. And he stood there with a tube, something for toothbrush, a toothpaste or something, and did this. People waited. And finally, Stan said, Look, someone invented um, like a coating, a coating which will not break when we do this. <laughs> and, and then there are other examples where he, in Mannheim, he gave lectures about electricity and Ariman and he lived always there, uh, stayed over in the family. And um, then next time he came back and they had their old fireplace or oven reinstalled for wood or coal. And Steiner asked him, and where is your wonderful electrical oven? And the man said, yes, you spoke about Ariman and electricity. <laughs> and so we thought it would be better to replace it with the old one. And Stan said, but that is not the way to face <clears throat> electricity today. And so we see he had, was in a way open, but always considered, and that is the main theme in a lecture he gave about technology and art, <clears throat> how to balance technology. At least that was at his time an important issue. And another thing I would like to mention is Steiner um, invented three new topics to be taught in the Waldorf school, which were not there before. One is a Christian religion without connection to a church, a free Christian religion. The second is your rhythm an art, a new art. And the third is technology. He wanted the young people to be taught how technology is working. If they enter <coughs> the tramway, they should know how it works, at least in principle. Now, Think of the task we have today when everybody has a cell phone. They should know, at least in principle, how that works. I always found that a wonderful challenge. <clears throat> so, in a way, Steiner was open to that, even um, intended that the students learn about that. And when he spoke about technology in this lecture I mentioned, um, he spoke about the impact, especially on the sleep, how it disturbs the sleep when we sleep on a ship or on a train or something. So how it affects the part of the human being where we sleep, the will. That is something I, will, I would like to come back to later. <clears throat> so there were several mentioning of technology and then we have not much about that and he wrote these letters to the members of the Anthroposophical Society um, on a weekly basis from September 24 to March 
13 when he died. And the last letter was even only published after he passed the threshold. And then when we read this letter, it is like in the sequence of these letters, like a totally new theme. And there he coins, so to speak, the term subnature. And, and I would like to read to you how he did that. So he speaks about the human being and its relation to the cosmos and nature and how different is the, the relation to the earth and the mechanics. And then, by far the greater part of that which works in modern civilization through technical science and industry, wherein the life of man is so intensely interwoven, is not nature at all, but subnature. It is a world which emancipates itself from nature, emancipates itself in a downward direction. And it's the only place where this word, this word subnature comes up, and this is the only description. So we don't have a book about subnature. And what we can see here is that it is technology obviously has to do with this gesture of emancipation and, and closure from the cosmos. And I think in a way uh, we developed the technology during the century which actually needs that more than anything else, the nuclear energy. And when we look at that, we have, oh, I thought I was the blackboard, but I can't find it here. We have this gesture. Where something needs to be enclosed and, and, and emancipated from nature. And then we have a second technology, a little bit later developed and increased during the last decades, where people walk around like this. So there is the soul, the soul um, emancipates from the surroundings. They have their phone or whatever, and if they are lucky, they won't hit, hit the post or the pole of the lantern or something. And it's both are like images of this and closer, closure from the surroundings, from the context. <clears throat> and uh, that is only an extreme example. In this letter, Steiner uh, implies that it already started with a mill. Very simple technology when it has a certain connection with nature because the water has to run over the wheel or the wind has to blow, but everything else uh, is, has its own laws. And of course, the more refined the technology is, the better this enclosure has to be. And then, Maybe I would like to add one word here. Uh, in this sentence about subnature, uh, Steiner said it 
uh, it emancipates from nature and a little bit before that it, it emancipates from from the cosmos and normally when we hear the word cosmos we think of something up there the stars and maybe behind them and from my uh, context of thought it's important to realize this that the word cosmos not only means the stars but can mean harmony order context so it is this whole context which could be meant not only the stars and then he goes on in this letter um, he the human being the man he must find the strength the inner force of knowledge in order not to be overcome by other man in this technical civilization he must understand sub-nature for what it really is this he can only do if he rises in spiritual knowledge at least as far into extra earthly supernature as he has descended in technical science into a sub-nature the age requires a knowledge transcending nature because in its inner life it must come to grips with a life content which has sunk far beneath nature a life content whose influence is perilous and a little bit later the relation to electricity there are very few as yet who even feel the greatness of the spiritual tasks approaching man in this direction keeping these words in the last letter of this person always touches me electricity for instance celebrated since its discovery as the very soul of nature's existence must be recognized in its true character in its peculiar power of leading down from nature to subnature only man himself must be beware lest he slide downward with it so there he connects electricity with subnature but what i would like to emphasize is it's not electricity is subnature i had a long discussion with some friends in netherlands who insisted that electricity is subnature and they referred to a lecture Steiner gave many years earlier uh, it's some of you might know it it's called the etherization of the blood and there's a question and answer section and there he speaks about electricity magnetism and the third force and connects them with light chemistry and life and with the beings of Lucifer and Ariman. But they doesn't use the term subnature, but uh, subphysics. Sub -physics, yes, sub interphysics, subphysics. And uh, this and closer, this gesture of of emancipation from the nature and from the context is not present there so i think it's a different gesture and here it's electricity which should be recognized and that's the big task as leading into that realm of subnature 
So we have two tasks from this letter. One is to understand electricity in that way. And the second is how to approach supernature. So I will go a little bit <clears throat> in this run of electricity and compare it with light, which Steiner does in several places. And light is something fascinating because we can't perceive it as something there. What we perceive, perceive are always bright objects, is brightness. And one can uh, go into it, but what we think when we speak of light is, for example, something in between the lamp and the bright wall, something in between. We wouldn't say that is light or that is light, the illuminated object, but this in between. And we could say that what physics did until today is to investigate this in between, to trying to describe this in between. And one of the, I think, really important results is that we think of something flying from the lamp to the wall, being reflected and then uh, hitting our eyes, that is definitely wrong in physics. There is not something flying. Photons, we can only speak from, about photons where light is absorbed or emitted, but not in between. Several experiments, especially in the second half of the last century, in the 80s, were done about that. And our good friend Arthur Zions was one of the people who worked on that especially on that question. So, what is light? And when we think about that from the point of view of um, theory of knowledge, we can realize if we don't have a perception, there's only one realm where it belongs to, and that is thinking. So what we do is we think of the relationship between the white wall and the white bright lamp. And we can describe this relationship and optics is about that. How to modify this relationship with lenses and prisms and gratings and whatsoever. And just to give you an example, <coughs> I brought a candle. <clears throat> and what I'm doing now is I use a very simple lens. I could even use uh, reading glasses. And um, yeah, leave it on a minute. Maybe you can see the lens there, even the windows, but it's too small. So, therefore, I took the candle, and now you can switch it off. That's the flame of the candle. And I can do that everywhere. There, on the wall, mm -hmm. up there. Could you do it one more time on the screen? On the screen again.
And we have a certain relation between the candle, the flame of the candle, and the picture on the wall. And this is this wonderful, um, this wonderful thing that it creates a context, a relation over space, which is spatial separated. The image and the candle have an inner relation. And in a way, that is what we gain by seeing. We can look around and orientate ourselves without going around and touching everything. It's wonderful to be in a in surrounding where we can see. So this uh, is a certain quality or activity of light that we have a context in the sense world which we can recognize and realize there is something we only now I speak paradox a paradox we only see by thinking there is a, a sentence in the philosophy of spiritual activity which I like very much like <clears throat> other senses are there to perceive, for example, sound, our thinking is a sense for ideas. So we, we realize something which is, so to speak, the lowest uh, level of spirituality by thinking. And as I said before, all the optical theories try to describe this sort of relationship. Okay. <clears throat> now let's go to electricity. The, the process I would like to describe to you is can start with experiments and I did weekends on that and then we did a lot of experiments but uh, today I will jump a little bit over that and remind you okay, remind you of your power plug. You have a power plug at home. And now what can we do with that? We can have like like here. We can have walls. We can drill holes. Some people use hard wires. <coughs> We can uh, ride the elevator. We can today go with the electric car. We can do chemistry. I always find it uh, significant 
living close to Basel in Switzerland, and you might know Basel is the center of the Swiss chemical industry. So, um, Syngenta, um, earlier Siva Gaigi, La Roche, all these big companies are there. Why? They had salt, salt from the earth and electricity. The water coming down from the Black Forest produced a lot of electricity. And if you have salt and electricity, you can do electrolysis. And then you have a very strong acid and a very strong uh, alkaline. And then chemistry is open. So it's actually how it's done. We, have, we can do chemistry and probably a lot more. Now, what is on the other end? There's long cable and then the power station. So, how is the power station? There can be water. There can be coal. coal. There can be wind. Nuclear. Hmm? Nuclear. Nuclear, of course. Yes. Natural gas. Gas. Um, so batteries. And so on. When you use it, do you think about that? The other side? Normally not. And what we can do with the electricity has nothing to do with this. We can't feel or see or whatever, measure whether it was uh, generated by water or nuclear energy or sun, or you forgot the sun, or night, sun. There is nothing like biodynamic electricity because it has no quality. You can't have electricity with good quality because it has no quality. <clears throat> now we discover something. Electricity it can separate cause and effect. So um, Maybe we take the coal and we light the coal and we have a fire and then we have warmth and light together with the burning coal. With electricity, part of that is separated at a different place. So it separates the context in space and even more in quality. The burning fire has nothing to do with uh, driving a car or the falling water with light. Nothing to do. So normally we couldn't have light by letting water fall down somewhere. But electricity makes it possible that this the quality of the power station is separated from the quality of the result. We are totally free what we do with the plug 
And on the other hand, because the power company is free how they get their electricity. And it would need a certain thinking to say, no, I only want green electricity. How do we get this? It is never green. We can only trust the company that they, when they tell us 40% of electri our electricity is renewable energy. We can only trust that. <clears throat> so this is the two first aspects I would like to mention with electricity. No quality, separating cause and effect or separating the context in space and quality. Then the next step, when you go to school or elementary school and they teach you about electricity, they will probably tell you about electrons moving in the cable. But on one hand, it is totally impossible to observe anything moving in the wire. And the wire stays as it is. We can use 100 years old uh, copper cables today. No problem. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but I know in the US, the grid is a special problem. <laughs> this, that the energy is moving inside the wire, is physically wrong. There are even articles where uh, honorable teachers or honorable physicists think about that, that they say, actually, we teach them something wrong. Because when you do the theory of energy transportation here, I can only tell you that the energy is not transported inside the cable, but outside. <clears throat> the, the vector in physics with, which describes that, the pointing vector, gets zero inside the cable. Isn't that astonishing? The energy transportation is in the field, not in the matter. But the matter is necessary to um, guide it. So we have again something which is invisible, unperceivable as light. And again, it has something to do with space, but in a totally different way. In the, with light, we have this possibility of images in the space. Wherever I put the lens, I can make the image. The image of the reality on the other side. Here, the connection is nearly vanished. The only the rest, the minimal rest which we have is what we call energy. And that is on your bill when you pay for your electricity. And so there is a certain uh, similarity between money and energy because it's nothing, it has no quality, but the possibility to do something. <clears throat> so that is similar to life, but in the same way different because it has no quality, no qualitative relationship, only a quantitative relationship in joule or watt or whatever. So that is one thing, but I want, would like to mention another thing typical for electricity, and that is <clears throat> that here uh, 
so far. We can have a switch very useful. Now, what people discovered in the last century, actually at the time of Rudolf Steiner, they discovered first in philosophy and mathematics something and then imp implemented it in this technology. Because we can have two switches. One, second one, we call them A, call them B. And the possibility of light is only present with A and B closed. That's logic. So the philosophers write it that way. This means N. This is the result. And we can do it that way. One switch, second switch, A, B. <clears throat> and here it goes either with A or B. We need not to shut both, one is enough. So the philosophers write it this way. A or B. This is comes from the Latin bed. Now, third possibility. <clears throat> oh, it's good. Um, When A is pressed, C will not be there. The possibility will not be there because then this will be interrupted. Only non A, then we have C. So we have three logical operations implemented in electricity. Very simple. And what philosophers found out in the first half of last century is when we have these three operations, and, or, and, no, every uh, context, every thought, which can be expressed in formal logic can be expressed with these three operations. The whole formal logic can be implemented in electricity. And that is what all the computers need. They just connect formal logic with electricity on a huge scale. And that is amazing because it has no quality. It's only about context. But it is the formal thinking. And the light is a sort of thinking where the content, the quality, matters. <clears throat> No one can think what that has that to do with subnature. And when you think even of the light switch, nobody thinks that turning on the light has any consequences. How do you think about the consequences when I turn on the light or the electrical oven? But 
in a slight way, the turbines here are slowed down. Not all things are bad. So in our consciousness, we forget the context. Electricity helps us to forget the context. And the power station is somewhere else. However, what's going on there? And I think subnature is about forgetting or emancipating from the context. And that is what we do. We can have light without fire. And we can drill holes or let machines run without any process around. So electricity leads us, like it is expressed by Steiner, into this field where the context, the rest of the context which is still there, can be forgotten. <clears throat> and we can uh, connect that with all our activities, uh, which may it be with the screen or uh, even artificial intelligence, when the, the doctors make diagnosis, they can do it with artificial intelligence. They are quite good with these machines are quite good without quality, without a human being. And, and that is so characteristic for this electricity and how I think one can understand uh, how how Steiner describes this in this letter, that it leads to subnature or it leads to forget the context. And so I would like to say electricity from that point of view is similar to light. So something etheric, but in a formal way, only quantitative and formal way, so to speak, broken. And the light has qualities and content. And now one can think, how can one approach supernature? And I would like to mention three possibilities for that. The first is, of course, entering thoughts which has, with, which has or have this quality of content and, and quality. And if we try to think in that way, that is something how we perceive on the first stage the etheric. I think the etheric, if we expect the etheric as some forces doing something out there and, and having an effect, we think it like a physical force. Can you observe it when, when yourself think of that? There is a force, I, don't, I can't perceive it, but it forms something. Then we think of it like magnetism or something. And I know Steiner compares the etheric with magnetism, but I think it's more an image than reality. And so we enter the etheric when we think such thoughts, and that leads or can lead to meditation. And it is interesting that in some public lectures where Steiner spoke about meditation, he suggested to rest and think about a single, simple thought, which was, wisdom lives in light. 
So it's a meditation about light. And you can think about it because it is not a thought, not an expression which we can find in the physical sense world. When you switch on lights, where's the wisdom? But we can do the following. We can try to, to fill the word wisdom with content. Think, for example, about what, what would we associate with this wisdom. It's different than knowledge, for example. And think for us about a situation where a group of people, I experienced something like that in the school where I was a teacher. The whole teacher collegium, collegium discussed a certain celebration and how it should take place and who should be invited. And there were arguments for that, arguments for that, and it went on for at least 15 minutes, I think longer. And then we had an older teacher, he was over retirement age already, and only taught high school. So he was not in all the stuff about the parents of the children and relatives and so on. And then he stood up and said, dear friends, the question which is of matter here is only what is good for the children. And with this sentence, the problem was solved in a few minutes. And it was for me like an experience of, this is simple of course, but it was in a sort of experience of wisdom where uh, someone could just raise the appropriate question. And so one can now look how we feel. We have this discussion and thinking and thinking that direction there, and then a certain question comes up, and everything, as we like to say, falls into order. And we can orientate ourselves, ourselves through that question. Now think of a totally dark room. We did that in nature, but maybe it's easier to do that in a totally dark room. And when I was at our institute in Göttingen at the university, we had still uh, photography with films. And so I worked in a dark room to uh, develop my pictures. <clears throat> and that room is really dark, not red light for the pictures really dark. So when you prepare, you have to memorize where do I put the bottle with the chemicals, where do I put my film, the scissors so to uh, cut it, and the tank where it is good. So then everything is ready. Then switch off the light. Now you create an inner picture where that is and try to take the bottle it is not there then ah there it is and so on and if everything is okay and you are lucky then it, it went well when it goes well if not you kick the bottle off the table which is not that good okay and then if everything is done and you switch on the light. You have this sudden orientation. Ah, there's the bottle, there's the door, there's the table. Every, everything falls into place. And you can realize the feeling you have in this transition is the same you had when you experience wisdom. And then you see from thinking that two concepts or two ideas have sort of harmony, one in the other. 
And I can tell if you do that with some effort, it is a spiritual experience. Steiner described that to experience thinking or experiencing an idea is the first spiritual experience we can have. And we can develop such an ex experience, maybe with a little bit of practice, and experience that we enter the realm of the ethereal. So that is, of course, only possible for someone <coughs> who wants to investigate that. Then the second possibility, I will only touch shortly, the po second possibility to enter supernature is of course art. When you experience art, you can feel that there is more to it than the physical appearance though it comes into the physical perspective, perceptive. You can perceive it, but in that what you perceive is more than what can be seen. So about art. And the third, <clears throat> the third, what I discovered or what I realized, I should say, is our relation to sleep. Everybody sleeps. And when we sleep, we enter the spiritual world. So in a way, when we sleep, we all approach supernature. And how do we do that? How do we prepare for sleep? Is it just watching the movie on the computer screen and dozing off? Or is it possible to prepare for sleep, maybe by reading something like a poem <clears throat> or looking at a picture, having a conversation, and then going to sleep, maybe with some questions, and then how do we wake up? <clears throat> and if one is, can pay attention to that, in the morning it can be like one has around oneself, oneself possibilities of ideas, not actual ideas, but possibilities. <clears throat> and it's like, I, I like to compare that with the landscape where some, you know something is just below the horizon. It's just a question how to get it out. And that is, I, I, one can, I can experience in the morning not some people experience something like that immediately when they wake up. I don't. But half an hour later, one hour later, maybe one and a half hour later, and maybe doing something totally different, suddenly something comes up from the questions of the night before. Or you should speak with this person. There is an open thing. And that it's, it's like someone is nudging you to do something. <clears throat> and Bruder Steiner uh, gave in one lecture, emphasized this preparation for sleep. And I would like, because I love that so much, and <clears throat> with this passage, that is from a lecture uh, from 1917, 20th of February. Only short part. P. 
people should at least become gradually able to develop a feeling which can be expressed somewhat as follows. I am going to sleep. Until I wake, my soul will be in the spiritual world. There, it will meet with the guiding power of my earth life, who lives in the spiritual world and who soars round and surrounds my head. My soul will have the meeting with my genius. The wings of my genius will come in contact with my soul. And then he goes on. Yes, my dear friends, as regards the overcoming of the materialistic life, a great deal, a very great deal, depends on whether one can create a strong feeling of what this means when one thinks over one's relation to sleep. The materialistic life can only be overcome by stimulating intimate feelings such as these, which are themselves in correspondence with the spiritual world. So that is another possibility to relate to a supernature and so a sort of orientation not to fear and avoid technology as long as it is not too dangerous of course and so on that is obvious but to work on a balance, to create a balance to the life in this world and maybe to, to do something, to live and to work in this situation of crisis. Thank you for your attention. And Thank you, people abroad, for your attention and patience. <laughs> Will you take any questions, or are you done for tonight? <laughs> of course, if there are comments or questions, not only questions, even comments. They are welcome. It's a thing we are working on. I have some that have come in from the, can't say the ether, but uh, uh, a. Around the cable. Right. <laughs> Around the cable. Um, someone that you know, uh, Dr. Nina Neheja. Nina, yes. How does the electricity within the human body? relate to the man-made electricity. And she gives an example. For example, the AV node of the heart, which relates to the rhythms uh, of the heart, or the myelin sheath of a nerve fiber, which, like an electric cable, transports impulses on the outside of the nerve just like an electrical cable. I'm not, of course, I'm not familiar with the physiology there. Um, I know the normal uh, way nerves uh, guide um, an irritation, or how we call it. And Yes, I, I, I think if one would like to approach that in a euthanistic way or a phenomenological way, one should, one needs to uh, go into the field of chemical electricity and chemical um, reactions to electricity because the whole field in the physiology has to do with uh, 
for example, potential differences, which are uh, pulled up by um, separating substances. And, and I think the electricity, when, when you hear what I said, then it is difficult to say, what I try to explain, it's difficult to say, electricity is this. Electricity is a certain relation, a certain context, which possibilities, and if we reduce it from all the qualities around it, then the electricity in the body is the same in my approach, first approach, like the electricity outside, but uh, to get a broader picture, one should uh, compare it with chemical electricity and what sort of membranes are able to produce electricity in the body and so on. So it, I can't give an answer, I only see a certain possibility to research that. So another question, sorry if there's... There was uh, a question here, or a comment. May I ask what the speed of light is? Because light doesn't move very. Yes, that is always a question. I, when we speak about light, light as a context, what has that to do with the speed of light? Now, the uh, speed of light is only measured by, so, so to speak, the threshold between darkness and light. So you have a flashlight and when you turn it on, you measure how fast it will go until it is bright on the screen. And so when the light is there, it's much more difficult to speak about the speed, if at all. <clears throat> and so I would, I would say that there's one publication of, of a friend of mine who tried to describe the measurement of the speed of light with a phenomenological approach. But we agreed that's not the final word. word. <laughs> so uh, some friends in this, we have a sort of community of phenomenological physicists and uh, that's what I meant by we. And so I, I can only say that we definitely have the possibility to measure uh, a time when light propagates, but not when it is there. And um, even with the propagation, it, it is far beyond the possibility to experience something. So if you want to give students an experience of the velocity of light, it is, I say, nearly impossible. I can describe an experiment where they did that. They, they, you can have a time signal from a radio station on the ground and then this, receive the, time, the same time signal via satellite. And when you compare them with a good um, oscilloscope, you find a, slow, a, a slight delay. But is that an experience? So light, light, this velocity of light is a little bit outside what we can experience, but it is there, no question, in this realm. In, um, you mentioned uh, steam engines, and Steiner mentions when this was invented, it incorporated a vacuum in it, and he talked about Jehovah or Yahweh 
being driven out, the same God that gave the human being breath, uh, breathed into Adam and um, call that the victory of Araman. Um, do you see uh, something about that vacuum? Because the light bulb requires a vacuum to work, or a, a not a full vacuum, obviously, but a verification of air. And um, apparently, although I don't know this for sure, but I've understood that even when we make solid state um, devices or you know comp components, that uh, the process requires vacuum. Yes, environment. When you when you um, when people make the the wafers, they need the silicon evaporate and condensate and all that stuff. But I know this this place where Steiner speaks about it like that. But until now, I I don't have a, an approach to that 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 would make sense out of uh, phenomena. Of course, it's something strange when you have a very low pressure and that things happen which normally wouldn't happen. And all this um, research, which led to atomic theory and so on, was done on the basis of, of vacuums. And even the modern accelerators like Fermilab or Genf or whatever, Hamburg, uh, they, the main problem is to maintain the low pressure, the technical problem and the big. Mm -hmm. But I, 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 I know some some anthroposophical scientists uh, tried to fill that with something you can follow and understand. For example, Hans Leas, but it was for me not so convincing until now. Mm -hmm. But would you see that as part of the expression of sub nature or or just independence? Yes, in, in some cases, definitely yes. For example, uh, when you would have the in, incandescent light bulb in nature, it would just burn. That was Edison's problem. Right. And later, they didn't need a vacuum, but um, Noble guts, normally are one, and then it burns and goes. So it's not a question, but, but you know, it's it, with a light bulb, it's not a question of vacuum, but in other cases, too. And it is part of this gesture to, to um, emancipate the process from nature. Well, thank you all. Um, this concludes tonight. You're welcome to hang around. We have a bowl of fruit and some snacks that are leftovers from our <laughs> conference. We would be very appreciative if you could help us clean up our mess. <laughs> so thank you all. Good night. Thank you.